Hi right, guys, it is a lovely Sunday evening now here in the collapse of global industrial civilization here at Bugs in a Jar Farm outside of Ithaca, New York on this gorgeous Sunday evening, May 23rd, 2021 and the little dog and I and the rest of the gang here look at this filthy little dog, he has been out chasing froggies we have been out in the garden all day. We have the garden planted to get us through the summer. And Lord, what a day. Finally getting around to the end of the day enjoyment. But uh, since it is Sunday, uh, it is time. I have not done a Sunday sermon in a while, guys. And this is probably going to be a long one. Uh, don't know if I'm going to have time to read this entire thing. I'm trying to remember which one of my... I'm going to just put the little dog down so he can go relax on his couch. Who was it who sent me this fine article? Was it Lieutenant Tom? It might have been Tom. Some One of my fine lieutenants. Keeping me in the doom loop. For all I know, uh, every other doomer has already covered this. Sandy might be over on her own channel right now doing this. But uh, this is the Collapse Chronicles spin on this from the good old BBC, of all places, asking a question. I love when they ask a question in a headline. The question of the week from the BBC, could humans really destroy all life on earth and uh, I'm assuming we get to the definition of the word all uh, I'm not going to answer this question this is going to be a rant by a fellow I have never heard of uh, named Santhosh Matthew not even sure Santhosh is a guy but Santhosh Matthew is a professor not of biology as you might think but he is a professor of physics and astronomy at Regis College in Greater Boston and a science writer who has authored two books and this is a book length uh, essay he has written uh, I'm gonna put the link on here highly advise this to go read this for yourself but if you want somebody to sit here and uh, some old doomer to read it for you and maybe we will see if the ad cops yank this one down I got my fur I had my first uh, ad yanked down off my <laughs> by the ad cops the manga bay roundup yesterday we will see if the BBC uh, passes the ad cops since manga bay was too controversial so take it away BBC and answer the question, could humans really destroy all life on earth? The seemingly insatiable human tendency to consume is changing our planet and the life on it. But can we change our behavior? Hmm. Among the many global catastrophic risks known to humans, some are entertained in the media more than the others. Asteroid impacts, supervolcano eruptions, and climate change have all received the Hollywood treatment. And each of these have taken a devastating toll on our planet's life in the past. <clears throat> Yet, unknown to many people, a new global threat capable of destroying life itself is brewing in the shadows of our everyday lives. It is driven by the immense human desire for material consumption and paradoxically it is a consequence of human life itself. Just look around. You are inseparably surrounded by material objects I'm surrounded by this uh, material from uh, India or Pakistan. I have some old dead uh, Christmas lights I need to pull off to send to the landfill. I'm surrounded by a painting of uh, Mother Nature 
uh, getting ready to get her head blown off, that comment will probably get this ad, this video yanked down. Okay, just look around. You are inseparably surrounded by material objects, whether they are needed in your life or not. For every bit of this material we use, there is a growing web of global actions that is slowly stripping humans' emotional health, depleting Earth's resources, and degrading our planet's habitats. If left unchecked, is there a risk that human consumption may finally turn the Earth into an uninhabitable world? Do we have it in us to stop before it is too late? Yes. A team of researchers from Wiseman Institute of Sciences in Israel recently published a study that compared human-made mass, also known as anthropogenic mass, with all the living mass or biomass on the globe. They reveal that for the first time in human history, the former has either surpassed the latter or is close to doing so in coming years. I remember covering this study uh, recently on Collapse Chronicles that humans have made more stuff pretty much uh, than nature is making. The Wiseman Institute study estimates that on average each person on the globe, on average, each person on the globe now produces more anthropogenic mass than his or her body weight every week. And of course, when you, when you factor in how much does an empty plastic drink bottle or plastic bag weigh, uh, you really get the idea. The photographs in here are worth going on the link. Most of them coming from Asia, I'm pretty sure, these uh, photographs. Okay, uh, this is uh, Professor Ron Milo, whose laboratory conducted the study. Quote, the finding that anthropogenic mass, human-made stuff, now weighs as much as all living things, and the fact that it keeps accumulating rapidly gives another clear perspective on how humanity is now a major player in shaping the face of the planet. Life on Earth is affected in a major quantitative manner by the action of humans." Close quote. This revelation comes as no surprise to doomers, well, as no surprise to many who consider that humans have already ushered in a new geological epoch called the Anthropocene, the Age of Humans, a term popularized by Nobel laureate chemist Paul Crutzen. While the exact beginning of the Anthropocene era is debatable, there is no denying that humans have become a dominant force on this planet, altering every other form of life through our actions. The scale and size of the anthropogenic matter is alarming. Take the case of plastic. The birth of the modern plastics area came only in 1907, but today we produce 300 million tons of plastics every year. Further, the realization that after water, that after water, concrete is the most widely used substance on Earth is beyond comprehension. Concrete, the number two uh, 
and you can go to China for more of that, the massive geoengineering process initiated by humans took an accelerated upswing when materials like concrete and aggregates became widely available. These two materials, concrete and aggregates, make up a major component of the growth of of the of the growth in anthropogenic mass even the relatively recent human adventures of space exploration which began about 60 years ago is now triggering a disastrous space junk problem alongside this we haphazardly observe polar cap melts permafrost thaws and global temperatures getting hotter and uh, as they go through they send you links to uh, all of this there's probably at least 100 if not more links to other articles and studies and uh, then they do say the BBC does interrupt uh, this program to say if you enjoy what you're reading here you you might also like to read these articles how our cities will fossilize. Are we living at the hinge of history? And how weird could life get on Earth? We're getting ready to find out how weird life on Earth could get. Back to the uh, anthropogenic mass, although I would call it the anthropogenic mess. Back to the story at hand. So, why has this happened? Are humans genetically inclined to be materialistic to the point of our own destruction? Is the accumulation of anthropogenic matter merely a measure of humans annihilation rate? Or will nature equip humans to cope with this problem? Hmm. These are highly unsettled questions. There's nothing unsettled about the third uh, question. That question was settled uh, about 50 years ago. Will nature equip humans to cope with this problem? Well, uh, yeah, by, by uh, making us go extinct, uh, that'll, that'll uh, help us cope with this problem. Anyway, moving on. Although there is evidence that materialism is learned and shaped by culture, there are some who argue that natural selection may have predisposed our species with a desire to accumulate stuff. Our belongings can offer us a sense of security and status that doubtless played a more important role earlier in human history. Yes, all of these status symbols I am surrounded by in this room. Let me tell you, if I could go through the status symbols that I am looking at, in my little 384 square foot tumble down shack. Anyway, where were we? Somehow, creating new stuff has become a divine word in the collective human psyche. It's obnoxiously seated in all our endeavors from ancient stories to modern research and development rooms. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, goes the Genesis story in the Bible. Humans have been conditioned to believe that creating something new is a meaningful purpose of life and is the only way to advance our ambitions. Yet, we forget to put a cap on the use. This is my new $1 garage sale hat. The shirt came from the thrift store. Hat from the garage sale. The glasses from the Dollar Tree. Anyway, 
the limits of science have never been more glaringly apparent when trying to solve this conundrum. Reliance upon green technological solutions alone is flawed because the focus is still based on new stuff and more use, not to alter our lifestyles or business models that handed us the problem in the first place. Thank you, BBC, uh, for parroting uh, this crap of, about this Green New Deal. Uh, it is not uh, doing anything about the core of the problem. Nothing. Uh, that handed us the problem in the first place. Even if we can replace all fossil fuel based vehicles with electric ones, for example, cities are already struggling to take road space from cars and electric vehicles have their own footprint on the world's resources due to the materials needed to build them. I have done entire rants on this and of course the roads that an electric car drives down is the same damn road that any other car drives down. The rubber tires on electric cars are enough to take down the rainforest anyway. Getting back to the story, this is Emily, Emily Ellacam, one of the authors of the Wiseman Institute of Sciences study. Take it away, Emily, and explain this to us. <clears throat> Quote, the accumulation of anthropogenic mass also relates to urban development along with its associated environmental implications already witnessed worldwide. I hope that raising awareness would promote behavioral change that would enable finding a better balance point. Every step in this direction will have a positive effect. Uh, close quote. Yes, meaning get your ass out of the city and get out here to the country and plant your organic garden. Anyway, back to the story. Look at the carbon. This is not the environmental footprint. Look at one subset of the ecological footprint. We got to have this rant. The carbon footprint is one tiny subset of humans' ecological footprint. They are not the same thing. Anyway, look at the carbon footprint of our gadgets, the internet, and the system supporting its accounts for about 3.7% of global greenhouse emissions, and this is predicted to double by 2025. It is possible to cut down emissions with one less email or avoiding an unnecessary photo sharing on social media. It may seem like an insignificant reduction from one individual, but then add billions of such small actions together. Yes. And you will have, instead of an insignificant, you will have a statistically irrelevant, uh, anyway, I'm not getting back to the story. Big technology companies claim they are going green or set goals for carbon neutrality, but they rarely encourage people to spend less time on social media, you know, sending out rants like this or order fewer products. Rather, advertising and marketing models convey powerful messages that reinforce the motto, create and consume more. And it goes without saying that this article is, uh, is littered all around this article with ads. 
uh, as this is uh, going to be a monetized uh, video if the ad cops don't pull this one down like they did my manga bay ramp. All right. This irrational, savage materialism is ingrained so deeply with traditions and cultural symbols as well. In the United States, Thanksgiving is followed by another carnival called Black Friday. During this ritual, long lines of customers hit the malls and often get injured or trampled, but people are convinced that it is an effort worth the trouble. In the age of Anthropocene, humans may feel entitled to pin hope, pin hope on technology to fix any problems so that they can continue to do what they are doing, which is what he was saying earlier about the New Green Deal. All it is is this BS technology to fix the, you know, the fossil fuel problem so that humans can go right on doing what they're doing, which is taking down a planet uh, with or without climate change. <clears throat> Faced with the accumulation of long-lived plastic in the environment, for example, a spurt of innovation led to biodegradable coffee cups, bags for life, and reusable straws. But while it is true that a sustainable growth model that includes our environment has much larger potential to persist, we need a different approach to sustainability that addresses our massive consumerism. The corona panic has reminded us how fragile and unprepared human civilization is when it comes to even known knowns like a pandemic, you know, that has killed 0.02% of the planet. It has also taught us that human behavior can be modified with minor actions. Yes, the passive approach to proliferation of anthropogenic mass is not merely due to the lack of knowledge about its impact, but in general, it also has to do with the human inclination to dismiss facts that do not fit their worldview. Humans are naturally disposed to disregard issues that are not challenging their daily lives or those which dilute their convenience. Yes, dilute their convenience. I diluted my convenience. How many years ago did I dilute my convenience? Additionally, humans might find the solace, might find solace in the thought that nature might equip organisms to survive, no matter what we do. It is true that the slow and gradual Darwinian style evolution through natural selection is often overtaken in certain extremely polluted environments. Uh, talking about how a team of scientists found a strain of bacteria from bottle recycling facility that can break down and metabolize plastic. On the other hand, this finding shows the subtle and powerful ways in which human actions are changing the life on the planet. The adaptation of organisms in response to pollutants is a complex phenomenon. Uh, this is Alessandra Loria, a biologist at McGill University in Canada. Quote, 
In the long term, a sustained increase of anthropogenic mass would lead to the loss of habitats through physical dislocation and alterations of habitats such as contaminants with pollutants resulting from the production and disposal of anthropogenic mass. Uh, Close quote. Research indicates that negative effects induced by pollution often worsen over multiple generations. Do you think so? The rapid depletion of natural resources and biodiversity is not a normal evolutionary race that nature is used to. While some species can adapt to the changes taking place in our environment, humans are no longer a mere species that follows Darwinian evolution, but a much larger force that has come to drive evolution on this planet. Studies have shown that for most species, evolutionary adaptation is not expected to be sufficiently rapid to buffer the effects of environmental changes being wrought by human activity and our own species will be no exception to this. While there is no proof that we will destroy ourselves, there are clear indications that we ignore the effects at our own peril. For example, some of the mass extinctions in the Earth's history are related to acidification of oceans. The oceans absorb about 30% of the CO2 released into the atmosphere, which in turn increases the ocean's acidity. The oceans may be acidifying faster today than they did in the last 300 million years, primarily due to human activities. Getting back to Professor Loria, biologist Loria, quote, human life will be negatively affected because of the loss of the many ecosystem benefits and services provided by biological diversity. For example, water pollution may affect provisioning services such as food and water by causing a reduction in food diversity and or in its quality and safety. Widespread degradation of ecosystems threatens the conditions of life on Earth, in particular, the long-term survival of our own species, close quote. Our impact on the planet is much deeper than carbon footprints or global warming. This is one of the main points that I and Book Hermit and Cougar and everybody uh, are, are stating that, that carbon footprints and global warming are one little piece of the pie if they did not exist, the planet would still go down the tubes. If humans had a carbon footprint of zero, okay, and uh, there was no such thing as global warming or climate change, we might get a few more years as a civilization and a species and a planet. Uh, this, this is one of the fundamental concepts that even people who get it have no clue what uh, they're talking about. And good for the BBC for trying to hit us over the head with this, although of course it's buried way down. Once again, our impact on the planet is, is much deeper than carbon footprints or global warming. 
it points to a future where the effects of anthropogenic matter will take over if it has not already the identity of the earth and its life. In the face of this, humans themselves might lose out in the evolutionary race. Wouldn't that be a crime on the planet? Uh, humans losing out in the evolutionary race. Eliminating materials like concrete or plastic or replacing them with alternatives is not, is not going to address the fundamental problem with human attitudes and our un paralleled appetite for more. This is exactly where materialism can seamlessly transform into a known unknown risk factor in global catastrophe. The myriad of ways in which it can turn this planet into a mundane world is something our civilization has never experienced before. In the absence of a fully secure evolutionary shield, we could depend on our intelligence to survive. Hmm. Nevertheless, as Abraham Lowe, a professor of science at Harvard University and an astronomer who is searching for dead cosmic civilization, puts it, quote, The mark of intelligence is the ability to promote a better future. If we continue to behave this way, we might not survive very long. On the other hand, our actions could be a source of pride for our descendants if they sustain a civilization intelligent enough to endure for many centuries to come, close quote. And obviously, uh, this man knows damn well there is no chance that's going to happen. The story of Bama Sura in Hindu mythology offers an eerie parallel to the impact of materialism. As a devotee of Lord Shiva, he obtained a book, a, a boon from Shiva, which empowers him to turn anyone into ashes with a mere touch on the head. Immediately after gaining this magical ability, he tries to test it on Shiva himself. Shiva manages to escape, the story goes, but humans may not be lucky enough to flee from their own actions unless we offer a different vision rooted in the reduction of consumption the flames of our own materialism might consume both us and our pale blue dot. Amen. I think brother, or it might even be sister, Santhosh Matthew, professor of physics and astronomy at Regis College in Boston. Anyway, can't believe that uh, this person has gone under my radar, but, uh, you know, good for the BBC. Uh, I know that uh, Andy the Gardener gives BBC uh, a lot of crap, uh, but compared to the mainstream media over here on this side of the pond, you know, kudos to the BBC. We might have to come back to some of these other sermons in the future. How weird can life get on planet Earth? Maybe we'll save that for next Sunday. But right now, my uh, I smell my uh, 
my, uh, what do they call the rainbow stew uh, cooking in the crock pot, we went through the refrigerator and we scraped out all the various uh, leftovers in the refrigerator in, into a big stew pot, stirred the pot up, stuck it in the crock pot, and it's smelling pretty good. And uh, so I'm going to go enjoy some, uh, some of that and highly suggest you get out there and, and make your own stew while you still can. Bottoms up. Bye, guys.